Welcome to this year-ending Golf Improvement Podcast, episode 142. Welcome to the podcast for golf lovers and enthusiasts who are looking to take their games to new heights. Dedicated to custom club fitting, short game improvement, and effective practice to improve your golf game. This is the Golf Improvement Podcast with your host, Tony Wright. Hello, this is Tony Wright from Game Improvement Golf in Oak Ridge, Tennessee with the Golf Improvement Podcast, dedicated to sharing useful information on true custom club fitting, short game improvement, and effective practice techniques. I create exceptional golf clubs. You shoot lower scores. Well, get ready for some podcast interview fun and learning with my good friend, Mike McFadden, 38-year PGA teaching pro, custom club fitter, and sports director at the Jacobsburg Hotel and Golf Resort in Jacobsburg, Germany. This is my annual end-of-the-year interview with Mike, and actually, it's the sixth one we've done. And I love to do this each year because he has so much great and valuable information to share with golfers and custom club fitters. So enjoy my annual interview with PGA professional Mike McFadden talking golf problem solving. www.gameimprovementgolf.com Hello, this is Tony Wright with episode 142 of the Golf Improvement Podcast. Well, it's Christmas and holiday time, so I made a promise to my good friend Mike McFadden that my end-of-the-year podcast would always be with him, and so again it is. Mike's, I keep saying a 30 plus year, it's creeping up on the above the 30 plus years. PGA golf professional, custom club fitter, and sports director at the, still, I believe, sports director at the Jakobsberg Hotel and Golf Resort in Jakobsberg, Germany. And in preparing for this, you know, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but, but what we might call this is kind of uh, practical motor learning tasks in golf. And not every one you could do but some that might be interesting to our listeners. How's that sound for sort of a, a theme, Mike? I'll take it. That sounds pretty good. I think I might be able to contribute something. <laughs> You're and it's funny. been here. Tony, I'm on the end of my 38th year as a golf professional. End of 30. 26, 26 of them at Jacobsburg. Okay. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to write that down as we're going. There we go. End of 38th year. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, first, Mike, uh, just a little update for some people. Some of the most fun golf improvement, like maybe, um, I don't know if it's things is the right word, but, you know, efforts to help people that you did this year. Because I know you do a lot of teaching and and coaching of coaches and things like that. But a couple of those things that just really stand out for you for the year that, that make you sit back and say, that was really great. Well, let's start with the most fun one. And the most fun one was I took a week off in June and went to the BMW Open. And because I know the tournament director, I had a player's pass for myself and the whole family, meaning I had access to just about everywhere except the VIP tent. And as far as a learning experience goes, it was just awesome to sit for an hour or two around the putting green, close up, could walk on the putting green, uh, talk to players if I wanted to talk to players. And the pitching green, the short game area, uh, that kind of hypnotized me there. I was there quite a while, looking, filming, learning, asking. Wow, that's that's incredible. (laughs) <laughs> and, and it's probably it's probably a. I mean, there were some name players there, but there's probably half the the players on the European tour most Americans don't know. But just like in America and on the second level tour, these guys are good. Even from them, you see unbelievable things what they can do with bounce around the green and the rhythm of their shot and how clean the contact is, how they change 
speeds just based on from one shot to the next they'll sit there while they're practicing and hit one like this and the other one exactly the opposite and then one in between and the next shot back to the first one and and i was like a kid in a candy store there so a lot of goldilocksy stuff huh <laughs> i love that word for for different things about about practice but you might it may come up today or may not again but yeah I, I, I also went to a junior golf congress. What was really cool about that, there was about 400 attendees, all golf pros or people in some way, shape, or form working in golf. Um, There was a guy from ice hockey and a guy from handball and a guy from speaking. And it was really interesting how well they connected the transfer of what you can learn for our sport, because it was all about golf, from our sport out of other sports, how they train, what they do. The guy from ice hockey was excellent with explaining how to hit different shots and just exactly, and he's a golf pro, but he had played professional ice hockey. And then how what he learned in ice hockey helped him learn golf so quickly, the transfer, basically. I guess that was, it was was a kind of a red thread that went through the whole three days about the transfer from skill uh, coordination or whatever from one sport to the other. I mean, we know that with baseball in America. If you can hit a baseball, you're probably going to be able to hit a golf ball. Well, hockey has always impressed me as one, too, that there's a a pretty neat connection, but, you know, the stuff that those guys can do with a puck is uh, Here, you had, you had mentioned it earlier. Um, I'm working with the education and uh, – examination board for the PGA. I had a really nice one with them. We went to a seminar with just the examining board, and the very first thing we did unannounced, it was a surprise, we wrote a test. It's a little oh. self-testing. They tested us, and what it is is we examined them in group training for ages 16 to 18, handicap 4 to 12, and they set the theme. It could be spin control by pitching, or it could be distance control by putting, or it could be um, driver, and you, get, you pick one randomly. You don't know what you're getting in advance, and you have to write a 90-minute training s- session for that theme and that group. And I got a one, an A minus. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, because after we all wrote them in the exact amount of time that the apprentices get, we passed them around and everyone graded someone else. And, and I was happy. I knew what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Some awesome that, that, stuff. Yeah. That self-testing. That was a, and especially unannounced. That was cool. I like that. Did, uh, did even for you with all the experience, it sort of get your juices up and think, get a little nervous? Or? Yeah. And, and yeah, and you know what happened? Of course, you're sweating. Palms are sweating. But you know what happened? I kind of ran out of time. I mean, I have to write this in German, which is not one of my strengths. And and uh, uh, towards the end, I had lots more cool like tasks to do for if this happens, then try this. If that happens, then try that. But I, I, I ran out. I couldn't. I think that's why I got the minus. Ah, oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> I didn't quite finish it. Oh, goodness. Well, you know when we when we set up stuff for things for today, I know you didn't want to talk so much theory, but it still I think is sensible to talk a little bit about the basis for why focus on tasks or focusing on tasks is is so valuable or can be so valuable for helping golfers improve. Yeah, I think in that area, there's so much swing technique training where everything's turned inward and you're checking this body part and that body part. When it actually comes to uh, skill acquisition, the biggest advantage of like focusing on task is external focus. You have an external focus, and if the task is set up correctly, you'll make different swings. You'll change your swing to solve that task. By the way, we're talking about when we talk about tasks for motor learning, there's like four different types of tasks, I think. I'm not sure because I only pay attention to the one that interests me, and that's problem-solving tasks. Yeah. And what I'll give them is I'll give them something to solve, and if they do it, then they're going to make the swing technical changes that I want without ever telling them, move your body like this or move your hands like that. Or, And I think that's the reason why it's so much more effective and so much more efficient. And they can go back and easily remember that they had that little problem, and so they go back and resolve the problem every time, right? Yeah, Until it sort of locks them, in. If you give them a decent task, let's say something constraint-led where the, you change the environment, they have feedback and they can practice it themselves, and they got the feedback. They know if they did it right or if they know if they, they didn't do it right and don't need any like 
uh, toys. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's let's dive in because I know we've got a lot of these little things that we're little big things we're going to talk about. Um, but first topic is path control and face angle control, which are obviously connected. But you know, when 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 we corresponded, you said you were recently working with somebody, and I see people like this all the time, twelve ish degree out to in path. Okay, and one of the things you did is make a shorter or heavier driver, which is kind of a good start to make it go a little easier. Maybe you'll talk about that. But but what are the, the some of the tasks and that you specifically do to help golfers improve in these areas? And uh, you know, you did you did let the cat out of the bag and say you were able to get this person to get much closer to um and Eight out of ten from inside. You know, eight and out of other, ten from inside. The other two were one or two degrees outside. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of amazing. What, that, remember, I told you I was going in to build clubs today. Well, that was that dude's clubs. Okay. And and in the beginning, when we started testing with the driver, I got him down to about half with a, a heavier and shorter driver. Um, and then I gave him really just one task, and that was on our driving range. I know I told you before, the golf course used to be owned, the whole facility with hotel by the guy from Haribo, Gummy Bears. Yeah. And on the driving range, we have big, two-meter tall, very bright-colored gummy bears out of metal. I, the boss built them for me once, so we use them as targets. And I extra had him put a red one on the right side of the driving range. And the only thing I told him to do was, okay, here's our target. Remember that big tree in the background? That's our target. Look at the target before you swing. Then look at the red gummy, gummy bear and swing towards the red gummy bear. And that's exactly what he did. And the heavier, shorter club made it much easier for him. And uh, did he sort of start and, out and when he was doing some of that pushing it a little bit too, or slicing it, or yeah, just he, ultimately? He, let, he never sliced one, but he did leave the face open and pushed a few. But he liked the push because we have a, like a stone wall at the end of the driving range at about two hundred meters. And while he was hitting his driver, and in the beginning, nothing went over the wall. And the first two or three of the pushes carried the wall, so wow. he immediately thought, "Oh, that's much longer." Uh, and just like you were saying earlier about low on the club face, that was the first thing he did. He hit it low on the club face. He was pushing it and low on the club face because he was used to teeing it much lower, coming from outside, hitting down into it and moving up away from the ground, releasing early. So once I got him with the heavier, shorter club and then swinging more to the right, he was still moving away from the ground a little. So I pulled the tee out about an inch and he just striped one off the middle. Oh, Got gee. very big eyes. And, and it said... Three degrees plus, two degrees right, and real long for him. Yeah, I had, I had. Well, you saw. I wrote a blog post once recently. Yeah. You know, I did a seventy-five gram shaft with a guy, and first shot, he just, you know, always slicing it, and first shot straight long, and he's just like, you know, uh-huh. and it was forty-four inches instead of forty-five and a half. <laughs> So, I, you, this is a little off topic, but it's the blog that I'm going to do next week. Cal, Co, Cobra is actually starting to make drivers 40, 44 and a half inches for some people. They're going to offer. Yeah, I, re- I, I read I that. I saw that. I thought that was really brave and cool, you know, because it's what a lot of people need. Mine's 43 and three quarters, and I hit it better than any driver except my oldest persimmon driver, the last persimmon driver I was playing. Yeah, mine's full. And I got a yeah. and I got an eighty five gram shaft and I got a heavy head. Yeah, yeah. Now, any other things on you know, we talked a little bit about face angle control. How about pa- uh, not path not face angle, we talked about path control. How about any other sort of different things on face control? Face control? Well, for me, I think one of the first things I do with everybody when we're talking about face is step one for me is cognitive. Most people don't understand that the ball goes to the right because the club face turned to the right. When you ask them it, they'll tell you, well, I didn't keep my head down or I didn't turn my hips or I didn't keep my left arm straight. But no one, or not no no one, but almost no one will say, very simple, club face was open. Yeah. And so the first thing I usually, first thing I'll usually do with everybody is I'll have them set up, tell them, okay, now let lightly go of the club and I'll turn it in their hand. I'll say, let lightly go and I'll turn it way open, like 20 degrees. And I say, now just hit it. And they hit it and it like goes straight right. I say, okay, let's do that again. Then I'll turn it 20 degrees to the left and they'll hit it around the corner left and they've never hit that shot before. And then it's like, oh, light goes on, Goldilocks. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. 
Yeah, it's like, oh, the ball goes where the face is pointing? Wow, never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> so just understanding the, f- the fact that that's, that's, you know, th- that's it, that's it, right, yeah. yeah. And then I'll do something so they can see, like, um, what affects what. I'll do the exact same thing, but like this. I'll tell them, okay, let go of the club, and I'll turn it a little to the, maybe half as much to the left, so it's closed at a dress, and I say, close your hands again now. They've got their normal grip. They haven't changed their grip at all, and I say, now, without letting go of the grip, turn the club face so it's square. So now they rotate both hands to the right, and then I'll tell them, okay, hit it, and they'll almost always have left curve on it. And I can do the same thing. I always do, even if it's their bad side, I'll always do the same thing to the slice side. So they take it in their hands. I'll say, let go. I'll, I'll turn it to the right. Grip your club. Now turn your club face while you're gripping the club so it's square. And the only way to do that is weaken both hands. Yeah. Turn your arms to the left. And then they'll slice the heck out of it. So now they get the, a really clear conception. Oh, the ball goes where the club face is pointing, and my grip has a big influence on where the club face is going to point. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll, I'll always offer them like things like uh, a cupped or bowed wrist at the top or impact. Try that, like if they have a good grip. Or I'll even, when I'm working on face, even have them do things with path because path can affect face so easily. And, I, and I'll also have them work on release, arm rotation or not arm rotation. And the idea is when you, when you understand that face controls the ball flight, um, then the next step is what controls the face. And so you give them different options, and then they'll find the one that actually works best for them. It's so interesting to, to contrast this to, you, you know, I know you listen to the podcast I just did about the flat stick stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, th- I didn't talk about the details of what I know David does when he works with people, but everything is so much in the beginning when he's working with them about just really understanding the basic concepts of what's going on with the putter when it's working. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And and it's very similar. What I think you're describing here, uh, you know, about, about the driver or the full clubs. I would call that, and that comes later in our discussion here, I think, from one of those questions you sent me. Yeah. And that's like um, different phases of learning, and I would call that phase two. Once the fundamentals are there, you have decent fundamentals. They don't have to be perfect, and that phase should be short, should go quick. But, but once you have decent fundamentals, then you need to learn what happens when. Yeah. If I, the club's doing this, what's the ball going to do? If the club's doing that, what's the ball going to do? And that's like a very, very important development phase. Everyone who ever gets good has gone through it, either uh, intuitively or with help. Kind of owning, owning what the golf club is doing when they're, when they're hitting shots. And also so, understanding when the golf club does this, I can expect that. Yeah. If it's open, it's going to go to the right. And if it's open to the path, it'll probably curve to the right. Yeah. That's, that's not that difficult. You got to understand that concept. What I mean by cognitive, first, you got to understand that concept. Well, let's move on to another topic. How about that? Um, and that is, you know, one of the things you talked about wanting to talk about was uh, improving angle of attack, but also a little bit maybe on, you know, that guy that just balloons his drives, right? Which I'm guessing in a lot of cases is somebody that's sort of flipping the club. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to get it to go high in the air. But yeah, flipping the club and adding dynamic loft. A lot of people chop down onto it so much. Yeah. <laughs> Usually you can tell those guys they're teeing it down really low. They got a lot of sky marks on the crown. <laughs> and that'll get it to go up too. But if they're hitting it off the face and they're ballooning it, and with a lot of spin, then most definitely they're adding dynamic loft, and the, the way most people do it is with their wrist. Yeah. How about some of the tasks that you then, then get people to do when, when, when you see those kind of things? And are we talking about see the guy who flips it, or see yeah, the guy who the guy, it? Let's, I see, well, I see maybe choppers that flip. <laughs> Choppers that flip. I see a lot of choppers that flip. They're trying to recover from the chop. And then start moving upwards. So when the chop wins, it's a skied off the crown. And when the flip wins, it might be low on the face or or with a very high added dynamic loft. 
So are you Let's saying say we that the chopper yeah. and I had the chopper on the weekend, I'll usually tell them the first thing that we'll do is my, where I uh, test from and fit from, there's a little step. It's like a curb and I'll get him to put his left foot on the step and his right foot on the ground and say, pretend you're hitting uphill. And immediately they'll take their center of gravity, their right shoulder, move it down. The ball position slides to the left. And it's very good to get them to stop chopping. And I actually had to do that with this guy we were just talking about. He needed that as, a, as an extra because uh, he was a little left with his, his center of gravity as he went through the ball. He needed that to get that extra little bit of the right uh, angle of attack. If you get the guy who flips it too much, meaning release, that's that's a whole nother ball game. I usually move to small swings, and I usually isolate body parts. I'll isolate, teach them when the right arm extends, when the right wrist extends. Um, that that comes a little bit under low point. Oh. A little bit understanding understanding when when the club reaches its bottom because they reach bottom early and are moving up. Most of the time, I believe my experience tells me they only do it because meaning they're moving away from the ground when they do that, and that's their major motivation. Their motivation isn't to add loft or make the ball go higher. It's to move away from the ground. And the reason they need to move away from the ground is they're coming so steep from outside heading towards the ground. Yeah, so it's connected so, to, that, so they, to that beautiful little 12-degree <laughs> out-to-in, right? And I actually believe the 12-degree out-to-in, now we're going deeper and deeper in cause and effect, is yeah. because of an open club face. Because the club base is open, the ball goes to the right. The golfer sees that it goes to the right. He hasn't learned that it goes to the right because his club base is open, so he swings to the left. And those long, light-shafted drivers help him do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he's coming steep in from outside. That actually will help his open club base. You can cut it in the middle of the fairway. You can make a hole-in-one with that kind of shot. You'll never reach your potential, and there's not a high power transfer, but you can get it to kind of go where you want it to go, but it brings the problem with it. The club's moving downward, and now i got to move away from the ground, and the easiest way to do that is with your wrist or elbow. Either you stretch and stand up, or you do it with your wrist and elbow. Some people do all three. And is some of it, too, because they're just, you know... I get. I'm starting to pay much more attention to you know people's spine angle with the big long clubs, right? And yeah, they're just standing address, so much, so so up at address instead yeah. of being in you know what what I would call an athletic position, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's actually dysfunctional for for the way we want to move a golf club uh, efficiently. Standing so straight up with the driver is not that uh, efficient. <laughs> And so they need to be shorter or you need to be taller. Hmm, I don't think, I think there's only one of those that's probably easier to do. <laughs> Gonna work, yeah. <laughs> I always wanted to be taller when I was a kid so I could dunk the basketball, but that's another story. <laughs> well, I, I fix that here. I fix that, Tony. I have two basketball courts in my driveway and I can reach up and touch the rim. Ah, well. So dunking's easy. But you know what I noticed? Dunking hurts. <laughs> I don't know how those guys. I don't know how they do it. Yeah, that's, when you when I slam onto the rim like that, my arm says, "Mm mm, mm mm, that's not good for your golf game." Wow. Well, you mentioned low point, which was the next question, and low point can be with lots of different shots, right? I mean, it's just as important with the driver as it is with with irons or wedges and and any shot. Um, talk a little bit about you know what. What you really want to do mostly talk about mostly about low point and some of the th things you get people to do, and again, some of it probably is just awareness in the beginning, right? I would say low point is in the top five of sacred skills you need to learn, like hitting in the middle of the club, understanding that the club face decides where the ball goes, how swing path affects what the ball does, and I would say low point's right up there in the in the top five, and it's real simple why like most people don't like low point or don't like hitting the ground, they're scared of the chili dip. They're scared of the fat shot. More, th anyone more, who, more than anyone the who's doing yeah. that. Anyone who's doing that flipping, when they, when they release like that, the low point's behind the ball. So if they do hit the ground, I mean, probably the only thing worse than a, a shank is the chili dip where the ball, you take a big swing, hit way behind them, and it's laying three feet in front of you. Do you get them then to do a lot of shots where they don't care about the fact that they may sort of skull it first to just get the feel yeah, of that? I, 
I'll definitely teach them that if you're hitting a ball that's on the ground, it's conducive to hitting the ground. If you're hitting a ball that's up in the air, I call it a princess lie, like a driver teed up nice, eh, let's just stay away from the ground. You don't really need to hit the ground with that one. Most people um, hit the ground with the driver and don't want to touch the ground with the, with the iron, which is exactly opposite of what you want to do. And the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll take the club from him. And I'll, an English friend of mine taught me this. And I'll just hit it on the ground. I go, you hear that? Let me do it again. Thump. 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 So every time the ball is lying on the ground, I want you to make that noise. You are going to make that noise with every one. Now, in the beginning, I'll predict it. I'm pretty good at predicting. It's probably going to be behind the ball more than once. Okay? But hitting the ground is better than not hitting the ground. If you hit the ground in the wrong place, then we'll figure out why you're hitting the ground in the wrong place, and we'll move it to the right place. But if you're not hitting the ground, you're farther away. And if you're hitting the ground with the driver, you have not read the instruction manual. It's not <laughs> supposed to do that. So with irons, it's just, it's a, a neat task is just, in a way, missing it first and being aware of it, Right. Yeah, and, and I'll do things because, you know, like we said, task-oriented and things they can work on their own with feedback. I usually draw a line on the ground with that marking paint, you know, like yeah. they mark the golf course in white and red. I'll draw a line and I'll tell them, I'm going to go get a cappuccino. You call me when the line's gone. And I want you to set up to it as if the ball's the line and let them try to figure it out themselves. Naturally, some people are going to need help, but some don't. And if they need help, then I'll give them some uh, hints on what to do to make it easier to hit the line. I'll also do stuff like I'll put a T in front of the ball and say, hit the T, get the T to move away. So they're moving more downward at the ball. And if they skull one, I'll say, no, that's more than we actually need. Real good. Yeah. Um, and I'll do stuff like I'll put a towel behind the ball. Don't hit the towel. That's, yeah, all, that, constraint that's yeah. all constraint-led stuff, where constraint is you either change the rules, the tools, or the environment, and there I'm changing the environment. So they have to come from downward towards the ball if they don't want to hit the towel. I'll put an old lie board back there so that so that you can hear it and feel it if you hit it. Uh, that's that's the meaner one version compared to the towel. Yeah, <laughs> it depends on how much, how, how much, and I'll tell them the lie board is made of steel and it's electric. <laughs> don't hit it. <laughs> and then I'll always do, okay, we're going to make the 100 euro bet. If you hit it, I get 100 euros. If you don't hit it, you get 100 euros. You'd be surprised how many people who hit it five times in a row and then you tell them for 100 euros, they don't hit it. Yeah. You got to find out where they're motivated. Oh, those are all good ones, Mike. Thanks. Well, you know, this next one's one of my favorites because it's one of the things that when I go out before I play, I always do something. I do, I'll do like 30, 50, 70 yard shots. But I, at least for me, and this may not be the way you teach it, you know, I have them hit it. I, I hit my, my shots longer than my target, shorter than my target, and at my target. And I think that has had the biggest impact on my ability to control distance with those shots. Um, you know, distance control for short, like 30 to 80 yard pitches. Um, what are some of the things you do? Obviously, you got to get them to hit the ball right first, but what are you, some of the tasks you do with them to kind of learn that skill, which is such an important skill for short game? First off, we agree in putting, chipping, pitching, bunker, long game driving, distance control rules. And the first imperative is you do have to hit the ball relative consistently to be able to do distance control. But let's say we got that where like half the balls are okay. That's already good enough to do distance control work. And my two favorite um, like tasks would be take the same club to different targets. That's just what you were saying. You said 20 to 80 meters. I would say for a beginner, you could do four distances, 80, 60, 40, 20, maybe three shots each to start with, but then alternating. And if you're a little better, maybe drop it down to 15 difference. And if you're better, drop it down to 10, 80, 70, 60, 50. <coughs> Excuse me. That's okay. That means the same club, bunch of different distances. But I also really like different clubs to the same target. I like that in the long game. Okay, so, so a five, take 20 a five meters, iron, 20 meters yeah. and all wedges. Take 40 meters, all wedges. Take 60 meters, all wedges. Yeah, Say you hit a seven iron. Club. I'm just going to make it up, 140 yards, okay? So take your seven iron at 140. Now take your five iron to 140 and then take your nine iron to 140. 
And you'll go, yeah, but Mike, and then I'll offer you some possible solutions. Well, you could change the ball position. You could change your center of gravity. You could change gripping up on the club or gripping down on the club uh, and let them experiment with it. But for getting distance control, basically you're controlling the size and speed of the swing. And so what I like to do is give them problems to solve, tasks, which is a target and then a club, and say, yeah, you figure it out. You go away again, right? No. (laughs) <laughs> I do a lot of cappuccino drinking now. There you go. <laughs> yeah, but it's really important, especially when you reach that level, I shouldn't be butting in after every shot. If someone's a beginner, they're getting command style lesson from me. I'm going to tell them what to do, and I expect them to at least try. And I'm going to give them feedback after every single ball or every single try. But when you get to a level where you're hitting half the shots decent and you want to work on speed control or distance control, I need to kind of, yeah, be guiding them, but kind of stay out of the way. Feedback after every single shot would be in the wrong place. That wouldn't be good as conducive to better golf and improvement if I just kind of, when it was necessary, you know what I mean? Yeah. If they couldn't solve the problem, I would analyze why they couldn't solve the problem, and then I'd come with suggestions to try to make it easier for them to solve the problem. Yeah. They're one of my favorite ones for distance control and speed and size of swing control is everybody take their driver. Tee it up. I want a full swing. I don't want uh, any messing around. Full swing, and we're going to go for 100 meters. Who can hit it to 100 meters sign? Oh, so they slow down enough as they take yeah, the full I mean, swing. You can really see who has their swing under control and who doesn't, who has their rhythm. It's so funny how there'll be like a hiccup in there if they, if they, if they don't have it under control. It's a really hard shot. Full swing, full backswing, full finish, and the ball should only go 100 meters. You can do that with which is which is yeah. which is less than half of all the people I'm talking about. Yeah, how would they normally hit it? And you can do that with a five iron too, right? Yeah, Same thing. You make it shorter all distance. Kind, do 50, all, yeah. 50 meters full swing with a five iron. Well, I left a spot for you to provide some, um, you know, some of your favorites that I haven't covered. So, um, go ahead. If you gave me one wish. And you said, Mike, this wish is going to come true, but it has to be something that would make you a better golf professional. So everybody says, boy, he's the greatest. I would wish that everyone would learn to practice correctly. Yeah. That would be my – if it's time to learn technique and you need to practice your swing, then do swing practice, technical fundamentals, and it's going to be a command style and you're going to have to do repetition. But that should be a short phase. You should get out of it quickly and immediately start to swing practice too, which would be now let's vary them. What happens when I do this? What happens when I do that? As I get better at that and have found my preferences out – Then I would like them to do shot practicing, and shot practice one would be skill development. How do I shape the ball? How do I make it hook? How do I make it go flat? How do I do whatever? Shot practice two would be games and testing with scoring, personal best. And as you move down the line to the last level, then it would be game practice. It would be uh, practicing the game as it's played on the course and with lowest score wins and under pressure with a consequence. That would be the the one thing I would say, boy, my choice, if I could just get everybody. And you might be in level one with swing practice in the bunker. You just really haven't got the technique fundamentals down. So you need to do that. Do your due diligence. But you could be in putting already to testing. You've got the skill development. You've got a good set of fundamentals. You understand green reading, and now you need to practice Um, how good you are in certain situations and keep score and start moving towards exactly like the game is played. So it would vary in the different departments of golf where you're at, but if they took the practice time, the time that they take to hit golf balls and used it correctly for what it is they need to to learn, um, I'd be looking good. There is so much talk about, I mean, there's much more talk about suggesting that people do this, but I cannot remember at the place where I have a practice, you know, where where I do fittings, seeing anybody that practices that way. 
Yeah, I'm yeah. glad that in our course it's a little different because my whole team teaches like that. And we have a game, it's called Break 21. And if you're a beginner, it's called Break 27. Um, and it could be Break 34. It's real simple. We have a really nice practice putting green, and you're allowed to chip short little chip shots there. And you go around the horn from like 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and you chip to hole number one, and you putt it out. And you have to mark your ball and do your full routine. And you do that for nine holes, and your job is to Break 21. It's and almost, that would be practicing yeah. like the game is played. Yeah. A, a little bit like the Operation 36 things that are going on. You're, I'm sure you're aware of that in, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. with, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 yard things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Any, any time you don't hit very many shots, like say just one, and then you follow the ball and do the next shot, that's real close to game like training, and that's good. I, I have a ground rule for everybody, even beginners, never hit three balls with the same club to the same target, or more than three balls, sorry, three balls maximum. So if I give you a task, it could be any task, like I put a bucket in the wave because I want you to come from inside, and there's this little plastic bucket turnover, and it's in the you can't come from outside because it's in the way, and you're supposed to swing out to the red gummy bear. Good, you can do that. Do three drivers, then do three three woods, then do three seven woods, then do three five irons, then do three, but you're never allowed to do more than three swings, three balls with the same club to the same target. Have to switch. It's closer to how the game is played. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, any ending words today then or other things that you wanted to add at the end that you didn't? By the way, I found some of your videos online before I did this today. Um, Mm -hmm. That's kind of expanded a little bit compared to a year ago. uh, (laughs) It's a lot of work. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, I might get back into that right now. It's at a low, but we, we might be doing some more. Yeah, but but so any you know any any final words for golfers, which I think you almost said too. You know, just learn how to practice well if you really care. But any other things that you want to add today? Yeah, choose to have fun. I mean, why are you playing golf anyway? Almost everybody says to have fun, but when I see him out there, and when I see him practicing, I don't know. I mean, you need to develop a growth mindset, fall in love with the process. It's a great game we chose to play, so just go out and play. When you you hit a bad shot, I'd say the reason these New Year's resolutions never work is because it's always too big a deal. So break it down. I'm telling you, go out and have fun. Step one is after a bad shot now, don't get upset. Just don't get upset. Analyze, don't criticize. Maybe because you've been practicing correctly. Ooh, the last question. You got an idea what happens when. You you know yourself. So if you hit that bad shot, stop for a second. Say, oh, okay. It's because I did this. Take a practice swing. Do the thing you know you're supposed to do. And put the club in the bag. And putting the club in the bag means it's over. Done deal. No reason to even think about it for another second. Yeah, it's so huge in putting, too. I mean, it's it's one of the things that I think... Well, and it, it fits with every shot, but you know, in putting, there's just so much, you know, so much drama about putts. And if everyone was used as the learning opportunity, every shot should be used as a learning opportunity. Yeah, and I mean, look how lucky we are. If you're able to be out on the golf course, you're lucky. Yeah. So have fun. Well, this was let's see, number five of the podcast we've wow. done, Mike. How about that? Uh, thank you. Thank well, you for your trust, Tony. I, I want to say one thing, too. You know, during the time um, that I had my surgery early in the year, um, I got almost a daily cartoon from you to kind of keep my spirits up. And uh, you have no idea how neat that was for me and, and how it helped. And not how I look forward to getting them. There were some pretty crazy cartoons. Well, la- laughter is the best medicine. That's why I say to ha- choose to have fun. Yeah. Very good. Well, I'm going to put some links in the show notes, particularly to you know the site that has some of your videos. And um, 2020 isn't that far away in terms of when we'll do the next one, Mike. How about that? I got one more request. Okay. I want to do your closing jingle. Oh. Yeah, I want to do it. If you're in, in uh, anywhere near the greater Oak Ridge area, <laughs> hey, all of Tennessee, anywhere near Tennessee, and you have not gone to Tony, I don't understand you. You must not want to play better golf. And I can tell you why. Because Tony creates exceptional golf clubs, and you shoot lower scores. Boy, I can pull that out and do that every time. That's good. 
<laughs> I just want to do it today. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. And thanks for, thanks for sharing a, a lot of your great knowledge with people today. No problem. I always have fun. If you're in, in uh, anywhere near the greater Oak Ridge area, <laughs> hey, all of Tennessee, anywhere near Tennessee, and you have not gone to Tony, I don't understand you. You must not want to play better golf. And I can tell you why. Because Tony creates exceptional golf clubs and you shoot lower scores. Mike, another fantastic year-end interview. I said this before, but when I first met Mike about 10 years ago, he said these words that I continue to believe are important for any golfer who wants to practice effectively and improve their games. The task leads to the solution. Learning is the repeated attempt to solve a task, not the repetition of a solution for a specific task. I think everything you shared in this interview is consistent with these words. I put two links in the show notes to Mike's goodies, to the overall Jacobsburg Resort website, and also to some videos that Mike has posted to his personal website. And I just love the jingle that he recorded for me, and you're going to hear it again in the future. My shout out today is actually kind of a repeat one, but it's to two of my custom club fitter friends who've had the most influence on my knowledge and improvement in the past year. Keith Chatham from Precision Fit Golf in Kerrville, Texas, and Burt Reich from Gooder Custom Golf in Saskatchewan, Canada. There's no doubt in my mind, and I have a lot of examples to prove it lately, that shorter and heavier custom fit drivers will outperform the longer and lighter drivers you buy in golf stores. I put links in the show notes to Burt and to Keith's websites. Thank you, guys. And as, and as we end the year today, I want to thank all you listeners in the United States and those listening around the world to my podcast. I really appreciate the notes I get from you about how much you enjoy what I've done. And get ready for 2020. It's going to be another great year. Well, that's it for today. Normally, the next two episodes would be highlights from the 2019 podcasts, but when mental performance coach Paul Doolin from Paul Doolin Golf agrees to another interview, well, the highlights can wait. He shared some great information at the second flat stick putting conference that have changed my golf and my personal life. You're not going to want to miss this one. Happy New Year and see you in two weeks. Game Improvement Golf, your source of information and inspiration to become an exceptional golfer now. www.gameimprovementgolf.com